ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه اما بعد فيا عباد الله اوصيكم واوصي نفسي بتقوى الله اتقوا الله في السر والعلانيه اتقوا الله ويعلمكم الله we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon his last and final and most noble messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his family and companions and all those who follow him until the day of judgment and I enjoin you and I advise you and I advise myself and I enjoin myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilling his commands outwardly and inwardly and avoiding his prohibitions outwardly and inwardly one of the main wisdoms that we take from the hadith of Jibreel, a very famous hadith and a very foundational hadith, is that Jibreel السلام, asked the Prophet ﷺ four questions about faith, iman, about Islam, practice of that faith, and about ihsan, perfecting that faith, and about the signs of the end of time. About the alamat, the signs, or more precisely, he first asked him when the Day of Judgment will come and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as is famously narrated, he said that only Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows. He said, then tell me about the signs. And he went on to tell him about the signs. And from this, the scholar said that our deen is not only understanding our faith and our practice and perfecting those two things because we could do that when we're on our, by ourselves in a room, secluded on a mountain, wherever it may be. But it's also in recognizing the times that we live in. Because later on, the Prophet ﷺ said that Jibreel came to teach you your deen. And so the deen is not just theology and practice and perfection of those, those two, but it's also recognizing the times that we live in and knowing our place in those times. <coughs> And so even long before the Qiyamah begins, those signs start appearing. There's minor signs and there's major signs. <coughs> and one of the major signs of the Day of Judgment that it's close to coming is the appearance of the Dajjal. The appearance of the Dajjal who, in the Christian tradition, they call him the Antichrist. But we refer to him as the Dajjal, which is more properly translated as the Imposter Christ. Christ, or the false Messiah. And this is a very important thing to note because if we look at what Isa alayhi salam represents and what all of the messengers represent, the opposite of that would be a form of extreme evil. And so if a person came with the opposite of what a prophet and what a messenger came with, they would be easily distinguishable, easily distinguished. But these, this person that will come is the Dajjal, the false, or the imposter Christ. He's an imposter. He's a Dajjal. Dajjal is pretending to be something and fooling people into thinking that you're something that you're not. We know when he first appears, he will claim to be the Mahdi. Then he'll move that claim onto being a prophet. And then he'll move that claim onto being a God. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from following him. Because many people, many people, Muslims included, will be deluded into following the Dajjal, the, the imposter Christ. But what happens even before that comes? The Prophet ﷺ said that there will appear Dajjal, there will be Dajjals before he even comes. 30 Dajjals. And then we can infer by that that even if these minor Dajjals don't show up in our lives, we might have people, we might interact with people who act like a Dajjal. They present themselves as something, but in reality they're something else. And so what do we have as a protecting factor as a Muslim? What can we protect ourselves against this type, these types of Dajjals, imposters, the Dajjalic way of thinking, a false way of thinking? Because most Muslims, Alhamdulillah, will never come to you and say, I'm going to leave my faith. It's such a strong part of our identity as Muslims, and that's from the barakah of being from the ummah of the greatest messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We won't get a lot of blatant apostasy, which has happened. 
but we won't get a lot of it. But what we will get is people who are going to try to attack our identity and try to make us think that you can still be Muslim, but just change a few things here and there. And this is happening at multiple levels. At the levels of, sometimes, critics of Islam, at the level of people who outwardly may pretend to want to help Muslims as a minority, as a marginalized minority, but in reality, they don't want us as we are. They want us to become who they want us to be. And so when they present their arguments to us, well, why don't you do this or why don't you do that? You'll start then, you'll see that they will start to erode away our identity as Muslims while maintaining what we believe. So the Dajjal, does he come out automatically and say, leave all those things? Does he come with a, a system that's completely opposite to what we believe in? Because we believe in the Mahdi and we wait for his arrival. And we believe in the messengers. And we know that, mess that the Wahi revelation has ended with the Prophet Sallallahu But we know that Isa Alayhi will come back. We believe that. And we're waiting for him. And as an interesting note, many Christians don't realize that about us. I was once sitting with a man who wasn't Christian and he was, I mean, who was Christian, who wasn't Muslim. And he was learning about Islam and they were telling him various things. And then we just mentioned in passing the return of Isa alayhi salam. For us, it's a part of our faith. You mention it, we're waiting for Isa. Yeah, yeah, we're Muslims. We wait for him to come back. It's, a, it's not even something that we think about too much. But he had never heard this. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're waiting for Isa alayhi salam, peace and blessings upon him, to come back? He said, yes. He said, this is a uniting factor between us and you. This is a united, it was so profound to him that he said this could be, we need to focus on that. Aside, we know that the way many Christians view it, he says differently, differently than the way we view him, alayhi salam. But the fact is we both respect him and revere him. So when the Dajjal comes, he's going to play on those things. He knows we as believers. He's not going to come with blatant atheism. He's not going to come with blatant kufr and just say there is no God. There is no faith, there are no messengers. No, he recognizes we have a system that we work within. A belief system that we have 100% surety that it's not a fairy tale. We know this is the truth. And so he'll play on that. He will first come and say he's the man, then as a messenger, and then God. And then he'll even, he's presenting himself as Isa alayhi salam. He's not coming and presenting himself as something else. So now what does the believer, what tools have we been given to be able to distinguish between truth and falsehood? What tools can we look at? The scholar said that one of these things that we have to remember, and it's a root of many of the diseases of the heart, is ghafla, being heedless. Being heedless, but what does that mean? Being heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the root of many different things, and if we strengthen if we strengthen our faith to realize that we need to work to get away from being heedless, to ha from having ghafla, we will have that tool that when a dajjal is presented to us, or when a dajjalic way of thinking is presented to us, we'll be able to distinguish between truth and falsehood, because that's the believer. The Messenger of Allah described the believer <coughs> as somebody who is ayyas and fatin, who has Deep reflection, critical analysis. They don't just, we don't just take things. And he also said that you should beware of the uh, nur of the believer, the, the, the inner sight of the believer, because he looks or she looks with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The philosophy movement. But this doesn't mean just by merely stating the shahada that we're that believer. Yes, we're a believer. We don't believe in takfir of, of a person who states the kalima and outwardly has not rejected necessary things of the deen. We're not in the business of doing takfir of people. This is Muslim, this is not a, a Muslim. As part of our daily wit and our, part, our, our daily routine. But we know that all believers are not at the same level of their practice and their adherence to their faith and their, the strength of their faith. So but the, the believer that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is talking about here is that believer who has worked on their faith and been able to now really look with the nur of Allah and look with the tools and the power that this deen has 
given him or her. So how do we attain that? The scholar said that, first off, that ghafla, heedlessness, is one of the worst diseases that we can have in our hearts. And it's actually the source of all evil. Ibn Juzayn in his commentary mentions that the source of all evil and all foul things comes out of ghafla. Just think about it. There's other things that we can do, maybe an outward sin, whatever it might be. We miss a prayer, we backbite, we take riba. All of those things, if we focus on just the sin and remove ourselves from that, those things, we're not getting down to the root of what's causing that. What the root cause of those things is ghafla. Because at that time, at that moment, when we are commanded to do something and we forget and we're heedless of that moment, that's ghafla. And what's the opposite of it? Dhikr. Remembering Allah, not just on the tongue, but actually remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Umar radiallahu anhu said that the greatest dhikr, the greatest dhikr, we know in terms of a form, there's a discussion amongst the sahaba or amongst the ulama, amongst the scholars, what is the greatest dhikr? Is it saying la ilaha illallah? Is it, re is it saying subhanallah? Is it saying alhamdulillah? Which is, and they have a, an academic discussion on which is the best type of dhikr. But that's in the formula of what's stated on the tongue. But there's something that's more important in terms of a dhikr that's behind that. Because a dhikr can be even, in terms of the formula, even a person who doesn't believe can say la ilaha illallah. So there's something behind that statement on the tongue. And this is what Umar is talking about. He said it's dhikr of Allah. It's dhikr Allah inda amrihi wa nahihi. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at his command and at his prohibition. So at that moment when the prayer comes in and we look at the time and we start thinking, going through that process of do I have wudu? Where can I make wudu? Where can I pray? The, the, that process of thinking that for many of us has become second nature. We just go through the process without realizing it. That's dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's remembering Allah. That's where we're remembering, because when we pick up that phone and we go through that process of saying five more minutes till prayer time, or I only have ten more minutes, you are going through this process of remembering Allah commanded you to believe, and Allah commanded you to pray, and He commanded prayer at a specific time, and He commanded it in a specific way, and you're going through that entire process in that moment, in that instance, and that is what Allah is saying is the greatest dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now multiply that towards every instance of our life. When we're on the computer and a few clicks away, and we remember, mm, I need to get out of this section, there's some doubtful things. Or when we're about to be, enter into a transaction, say, mm, I can't do that because Allah prohibited me from such and such and such and such. That's dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the four ways to get into this state where we have that dhikr and that presence of Allah and that critical analysis of being able to look at a situation and not just take it in and not just move like a herd of sheep through life. What is it? It's four things. Istighfar is the first thing. To do istighfar, to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing is to visit those people who are in a state of dhikr and who are not in a state, from what we can see, they are not in a state of heedlessness. Role models. Salat upon the Prophet وسلم, the third thing, and reciting the Qur'an, the fourth thing. Istighfar, visiting, prayers on the Prophet وسلم, and reading the book of Allah Taala. And I just want to take a few moments to look at each one of these. The first thing, istighfar, what is it? Istighfar is not just on the tongue. Seeking forgiveness is not just saying astaghfirullah. And just as a note, for many people, especially Arabs who assume they inherently know the language, they say the astaghfar with a kha. They'll say astaghfir. Because they're, the, the makharij of the vein and the kha are very close. So we have to be careful when we say astaghfirullah that we're saying it with a vein, not a kha. Because astaghfir means I declare a breaking of my treaty. Astaghfir is different. But when we say that, astaghfirullah, it's not just with the tongue. It's going through a process of really making tawbah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about this process, about what we've done, or maybe about what we're thinking about doing. But it's getting us into this state of realizing that I have sinned. 
And what's at the essence, the core of that? Humility. We have to be humble. To really do is still far. We have to be humble. We have to be honest with ourselves and realize that maybe our actions on a matter, maybe something we're doing right now, that we've justified it to ourselves. Our opinions on a matter, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, is this really, like Omar said, remembering Allah? I have an opinion on a matter, whatever it might be. Take any matter out there, and we all hold an opinion. Or maybe we even say, I don't know. That's your opinion. I don't know. My opinion is I don't know. Is that really what Allah wants to, you to know in that instant about that matter? How do we resolve that? We first, we're humble with ourselves. We know we need to seek out, we need to seek knowledge on this matter to have a properly informed decision, do our due diligence. So that's the benefit of istighfar, of seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being in that constant state of recognizing who we are. Because if you look at many of the major characters, and by characters I mean just these, these people, we believe they are there. The stories in the Quran are not metaphorical. They're not just merely a parable for life. If Allah wants to tell us a parable, he'll say method. But when he tells us about Fir'aun, Fir'aun existed and we believe he existed as a human being. Musa alayhi salam existed as a human being and he had a life and we're told about it in the Quran, the most often recited mentioned story in the Quran. But those characters in those stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that did major things, think Fir'aun, think Iblis, think Abu Lahab. The, the point that caused them to do those things was kibir, arrogance. The solution to that is humility. So this process of istighfar, of recognizing our state as being sinning creatures, or at least having the propensity, the ability to sin, that's what's going to humble us. The second thing, they say, visiting those people who are not in a state of heedlessness. Now we can only judge by the outward. We don't know the ultimate reality of people inwardly. And that's why, as, as it's mentioned in the hadith, there will be people who on Yom Al-Qiyamah, they will be led into the hellfire. And there will be people who learn from them, who took directions from them, and they said, you told me how to get into Jannah, and that's where I'm being led. How did you get into, how are you going into the hellfire? They said, because we didn't follow what we, what we preach. We didn't practice what we preach. Essentially, I'm paraphrasing the hadith in English. So what does this mean? This reminds us that just because a person is in a position of knowledge or authority or imamship or uh, cleric or whatever term it is, mawlana, mulla, mufti, shaykh, whatever it is, doesn't mean that their reality is that they are in a state of constant dhikr of Allah. And by dhikr, I mean Umar's definition of dhikr. They could be in a state of ghafla, but we can only judge based on the outward, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I was ordered to judge based on the outward. So we go to those people and we try to see how they're living their life and we look to them as role models. And if we can't access them in real life, then read their books. Read the stories of the Sahaba. Read the stories of the Salihin. Look at how they did. And look at the choices that they made in certain situations and allow that to try to help us create decision-making tools so that when we're in that moment where we have to make a decision, we say, what is the ruling? that Allah has commanded about this thing, and now how can I approach that? That's the benefit that I see in visiting, and there are many more, but I'm just going through it as a short summary. Then, then thirdly, the Salah upon the Prophet wasallam, and this is not just going through it like a mechanical way of Salah upon the Prophet wasallam, but they say specifically when you're alone and with, and with full concentration of sending Salah upon the Prophet wasallam. And one of the things that it, the secrets, the many secrets of the salawat is that it reminds us of our connection to the Prophet And it draws us closer to him. And it makes us want to imitate what he did. It makes us want to follow his orders. It causes us to have love for the Prophet And it creates that connection that we need. So that when we're in a moment, we can truly ask ourselves, what would the Prophet do in this moment? So that I can have true presence and not be heedless in this moment. And the last point, reciting the Book of Allah. Again, the Salawat is creating this connection between us and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And reciting the Book of Allah is creating this connection between us and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And not just so that we go through 
a rote recitation of the of the of the Quran with not realizing what we're saying. Ibn Abbas said that all of those ayahs that were mentioned about the previous nations leaving their book, leaving their book, he said it doesn't mean that they just threw it to the side and didn't read it. He said they read it, but they didn't understand it. So we're talking about reading the Quran with proper understanding and not only of the Arabic, but of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is truly trying to tell us there. And that happens through a process of understanding those ayahs through the guidance of the scholars. Understanding what is the theological rule that we get from this? What is the legal rule that we get from this? What is the advice that we get from this? That's one of the many benefits of, of reciting the Quran. And it's a cure for removing ghafla, heedlessness from our lives. And so again, it's istighfar, salah upon the, istighfar, visiting those in a state of dhikr, sending prayers upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to give us the tawfiq, the success to implement all of these in our lives, and to be from amongst those people who are not in a state of ghafla, who are not in a state of heedlessness, but who are in a state of presence and who do dhikr as Umar anhu defined and so that we can be prepared for the Dajjal or those Dajjals that come before him or those who are like the Dajjals in their speech and in their actions. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala man ba'ad fa ya'ibad Allah wa usikum wa usikum wa usikum wa usikum wa usikum wa we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon his last and final and most honorable messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his companions and family and all of those who follow them until the day of judgment and I enjoy enjoying you and I advise you to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I enjoy you and I enjoy myself to have taqwa fulfilling the commands of Allah outwardly and inwardly and avoiding the prohibitions of Allah outwardly and inwardly. I'll end with a short advice on how we can implement these four things in our life. And the point is, or the advice is to make it a routine. To actually take time out of our day and say, I'm going to, at the beginning of the day, saying, I'm going to work on these four things in my today. Not a huge change in our life, but just today. How today am I going to really do istighfar for something? Real istighfar, with presence of mind. And how am I really going to visit somebody, either physically or in a book or reading about them? Or maybe, and it doesn't have to be um, a position in society that's associated with leadership, faith leadership in the community. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget, we think that visiting the righteous means going seeing the sheikh at the masjid or the madrasa or visiting this person. It might be the local butcher that nobody even thinks that he's a very good Muslim. Because outwardly he's not wearing the, 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 the outward garments and the gear. But inwardly that person has a state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if on a daily basis we just start thinking to ourselves, Allah put somebody like that in my path. And I've had friends, I had a friend of mine who in Mecca, he said, Oh Allah, just show me some of the people here who today who are very close to you. And he met some of them. But he actively sought them out and looked for them in the faces of the congregation around you. Look for them in the, in the streets. Don't look at what you might think would be a righteous person. Look for, have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you to those people. And it might not be a person who's following everything. There are people who pray five times a day, on time, in time, with presence, but their treatment of other people is horrible. And there's people who don't pray five times a day, which that's wrong, but their treatment of people is good. So on this angle, they don't have ghafla. But on this angle of the prayer, they have ghafla. So be able to distinguish between those two things. And that's a part of the firasa of the believer. And that's a strength that can protect us from the dajjal, that we're able to distinguish between the two things. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And the third thing in terms of salat upon the Prophet wasallam, they said as a recommended time, 500 a day. Which might seem like a lot, but if you just put 100 with each prayer, you can get 500 a day. And the same thing with the Qur'an. The reason why the early generations broke it up into 30 parts and 7 parts and 6 parts was to make it to where we could make it a daily part of our life. So if in the beginning we make a commitment of the day, we make a commitment to these four things. 
And at the end of the day, we review our commitment. And then every day we try again. We try again. We try again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not looking for perfection from us. But he is looking for us to, to try. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the success, give us the tawfiq in implementing these things and to give us the success and the tawfiq to follow his way and the way of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to protect us from the dajjal and to protect us from those dajjals that precede the dajjal and to protect us from the dajjalic way of thinking and the dajjalic way of teaching and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst the those who follow the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until the day of judgment and to put us in his presence and his, and his, uh, in his fold at the hawl of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وأقل الصلاة